Okay, so today we will talk about uh, electromagnetic boundary conditions and layered materials. So let me double check, everything's fine. Okay. Now, so one of the most important things with uh, pattern materials and the optics and electromagnetics associated with pattern materials is the fact that it has many different interfaces. At these interfaces you can have quite extraordinary optical phenomena occurring. Uh, things such, such as reflection and transmission, multiple reflections and trans transmissions, uh, such and multiple uh, reflections such that there's resonant conditions established uh, and that creates quite dramatic optical properties, as we'll see in a moment uh, in this lecture and then throughout this course. But it's when, when you have these interfaces that things start to become more complex. If we just had light in an electromagnetic waves and uniform material, optics and electromagnetics would be sort of quite boring, that you would only have various waves of various sorts and they'd go through and uh, and expand or be focused, uh, but they wouldn't really show the complex behavior that engineered materials can provide. So uh, we have to understand what happens at interfaces, and that's where boundary conditions come in. How do the electric field and magnetic field, the electric flux densities and the magnetic flux densities, how do those things behave at an interface? All right. So again, this is, um, to a large extent, a review. And in fact, this will be a review uh, out of, in your Griffiths book, uh, chapters, well still, it is uh, on uh, the electric fields, chapter four, chapter five, uh, and, and in those chapters, in chapter uh, six as well. You have, um, and this is the fourth edition of the book, you have the boundary conditions for the electric fields in matter on page 185 in chapter four. And for the magnetic fields in chapter six, uh, the boundary conditions are described on page 284, all right? But you don't have to have Griffith's book. Uh, every single electromagnetics book goes over boundary conditions in almost the exact same way as I will show you in these notes. In fact, when I did my notes, um, I didn't even look at any particular notation from Griffiths or Sadiku or Chang or any of the others, but, uh, but just really just derived it myself because I've done it 50,000 times. Um, but then, after doing the standard uh, boundary conditions, we get into something uh, fairly, really neat. Something that uh, I thought was quite clever when I uh, was first introduced to it. Uh, and that's looking at the anti-reflection properties of a single uh, dielectric layer over a substrate. So quite often you want to minimize reflections, whether that be an application such as solar cells, or optical lenses or any type of optical sensor where you want to get all the light in the underlying material to either sense it, measure it, gather it uh, in the form of energy as solar cells do or anything else, uh, you need to put on anti-reflection coatings. And so, so then uh, the example we'll go through in, in lecture 3a is uh, a clever little way of analysis, analyzing that called the geometric series approach to single layers. Um, and, and so that'll be uh, quite interesting. So, oh, and then uh, even before that, uh, we will have, uh, have analyzed the Fresnel uh, coefficients, both for normal incidence and oblique incidence. So today, what we'll go through as an outline for the lecture, we will go over electric boundary conditions, 
magnetic boundary condition. Then we'll go over uh, reflection and transmission at single interfaces, meaning you only have two materials, what I'm going to call a superstrate and a substrate, and an interface between them. And that's it. That's the first complexity that we have in our in, uh, beyond a homogeneous uniform material. A single interface with two materials. And then we'll, uh, so we'll derive Fresnel coefficients for normal and oblique density. And then we will apply that to a, that single interface to get reflection transmission from the MATLAB code. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next step up. We're taking baby steps in the complexity of our engineered materials in this class. From two materials, the next logical step up is three materials. And so that's where we have this anti-reflection coding, uh, where we will look at that um, using the geometric series algorithm, as well as um, as well as uh, in lecture three B, the reverse couple wave analysis. Okay, but that'll be in a separate recording. We'll only do the geometric series method in this recording. All right, so let's get to it. So, uh, we need to know how um, the electric field behaves at an interface. The electric field is a vector. All right? It has both direction and magnitude. The thing with vectors is that a different vector components, whether they're the component that's normal to the interface between the two materials, or whether it's the component that's tangential, meaning parallel with the interface, uh, at the interface of the material, those different components act differently at the interface, at and around the interface. As we'll find, it will be D, the electric displacement, uh, its normal component will be continuous across an interface in the uh, in the absence of a charge distribution that's externally applied. Um, so, say across two dielectrics where there's no surface charge of any sort, it will be the normal component of the electric flux density, the electric displacement, both those, D is called both of those, the normal component that will be continuous. Um, whereas, it is the tangential component of the electric field, E parallel, as we'll call it in the notes, uh, that's continuous across an interface, regardless of if there's a charge density or not at the interface. All right? And likewise, we'll see that it's magnetic flux density, B, that is, the, that's its normal component, B's normal component will be continuous across an interface. Whereas the uh, magnetic field's tangential component across the interface is what is continuous. H parallel is continuous. Um, in the absence of a surface charge, when there's a surface charge, uh, there will be a uh, discontinuity. And that's what we'll describe now. All right? So we have four different things to look at. D parallel. I'm sorry. D perpendicular, the normal component of D, how that changes uh, as you go, go across the interface, E parallel, B perpendicular, and H parallel. All right, so let's start with D uh, in the notes. Okay, so here we go. So with this, uh, the best place to start is Maxwell's equations. Uh, and so starting with Maxwell's equations, we have the first one, del dot D is equal to rho pre. The, the charge density, the free charge density, not the polarization charge density. So we look at uh, two materials, material one and material two. And we have the interface uh, between the two materials. Now, just like in Griffiths or Sudiku or Ching or uh, any of the other books, Ouble, uh, you, you draw what is called the Gaussian pillbox. Uh, it could be a cylinder, it could be a square, it could be a rectangle, it could be anything. But we make it such that it's small relative to the interface. 
and we let it have a height h. And the top and bottom have areas a, and they have normal vectors. Uh, the normal vector for the top is pointing upward, say in the y direction, and the normal for the bottom surface bounding this Gaussian pillar box is pointing downwards in the minus y direction. All right. So starting with del dot d is equal to rho free, uh, free, we integrate over our Gaussian volume, Gaussian pill box. Uh, on the right-hand side, it is just the free charge that's within our pill box. And on the left-hand side, we use the divergence theorem to change this volume integral over to a surface area. Okay, so now what we do is we let h go to zero, all right? So we let this pill box hug the interface. So when that happens, uh, the integral over the sides has so little area as h goes to zero that uh, those sides do not contribute to the center wall. To the center wall. It's only the top and bottom surfaces. So as h goes to zero, only the top and bottom surfaces contribute to the integral. All right. Also, uh, as we let not only h go to zero quickly, but we also make sure that a is sufficiently small relative to any curvature in the, of the interface. And when that occurs, uh, we have that the bottom normal vector, move it down just a bit, the bottom normal vector is going to be equal to the, going in the opposite direction of the top normal vector, all right? <clears throat> And so nb is equal to minus nc t. Also, with a being really small, the magnetic flux d will just not vary all that much uh, as we go from one side of this Gaussian pillbox to the other. All right? So it be, can be regarded as a constant. So thus, what we have, that integral, we can approximate it to be equal to uh, just d, which we treated as a constant, but d on in material one, but really close to the interface, but still in material one. That's why I have d sub one. Dotted within its normal vector, uh, n sub top, times a, all right? So this is the integral, the component of the integral for, uh, over the top surface. And then we have d2, the electric displacement in material two, right near the interface, dotted into its normal vector, meaning uh, this surface is normal vector right down here, so that's nd times a is equal to q3, all right? But we set up here, right up here, that nd is equal to minus n sub t, and uh, so we substitute that in there, we divide through by a, so we get q3 over a here, and we get d1 dot n2 uh, in top minus d2 dot n top is equal to what we call a surface, oh, I'm sorry, not a surface current, but a surface charge density. I have to correct that. So this is a surface charge density, all right? So this, this d dot normal vector, what that dot product does, it isolates out the normal component of d at that interface, all right? So we call this then the normal component d perpendicular. So we have so this is d1 perpendicular, and this is d2 perpendicular, and we have the minus sign in between them, all right? So this says uh, that if we take the difference between the d's, those components of the electric displacement, uh, that will be equal to any free charge at the surface, all right? So for dielectrics, generally you don't have free charge at the surface, so this side is zero. So what this equation tells you is that d1 perpendicular is equal to d2 perpendicular in the absence of any free charge at the interface, all right? Which is normally, usually what we have when we have a dielectric stack or a photonic crystal, things like this. But, that, but we, that's not what we have uh, when we have a metal dielectric interface. And we, we, we certainly will have a surface charge density at the surface of the metal, all right? But for a lot of dielectrics and things that we'll cover today, for example, a solar cell, um, we don't have a, a uh, surface charge density, and this is zero, and the perpendicular components of D are equal, all right? 
Okay. So that's one one of the four boundary conditions out of the way. Um, and now uh, just checking the recording. Okay, good. Now we have the second boundary condition. All right. And so we have the del cross h is equal to uh, the current density j plus time derivative of the electric flux density d. All right. So again, we're going to have two materials, material one above the yz, the xz plane, and material two below the xz plane. And just like in Griffith, Siddiqui, Uble, Chang, uh, we, we now do, we draw what's called, instead of a Gaussian pillbox, we draw an Ampereian loop about the interface. So um, this, this loop is in uh, the x, y sort of plane, and it goes both above and below the interface, all right? And it defines an area. Uh, within the inside of this loop is the area A, and uh, we're going to now do the integral of this Maxwell's equation uh, around, uh, along A, or over A, all right? So we are doing this over A. So we dot both of, both sides of this and integrate over um, this area. Uh, we do the left side of this equation and the right side of this equation. All right. Again, we let this leg of the loop be equal to a length h. So this one has a height of h. And then these legs, the top and bottom, have a length l. All right. You can see where we're going with this. We're going to let h go to zero uh, very quickly, uh, just like we did in the first boundary condition. All right, but let's not be too hasty. So, all right. So we have this left-hand side here. You'll see immediately that we can use Stokes' theorem to change the surface integral over to a line integral. We have h dot dl. This is just the integral j dot ds. This is the definition of total current going through this surface. All right, i. This is current density. This is i. Uh, this is the definition of i in terms of an integral over the surface of a surface current density. I mean, of a current density, okay? And uh, this term just stays the same. We've, we've switched the order of the integral and the time derivative. That's perfectly fine. So forth. All right. Now, again, we let h go to 0. Um, thus, on the right hand, uh, the left hand side, this line integral, the contributions to that line integral from this right here, the right hand side of the loop that has a length h, and the left hand side of the loop that has the same length h. Uh, that contribution goes to zero. All right, so we're only going to have to concern ourselves with the bottom and the top legs. We also have that this internal area is going to quickly go to zero, meaning that as we let h go to zero, the overall a goes to zero as well. And that affects this integral, all right? Especially when d itself remains finite and bounded. There's no physical reason for d to blow up. So if this remain, d remains finite and the overall area that we're integrating over goes, gets to be really small, this term will go away or just simply become insignificant compared to uh, any sort of surface current, all right? So now, um, the surface current can be large, and so to, thus we have to keep it. So uh, we, <clears throat> we have two things. Only the top and bottom legs of the loop contribute to the integral, and we only have on the right-hand side uh, this i that survives. This becomes insignificant as we let h go to zero. All right? So uh, we also let the links l become small, not quite uh, as rapidly as h becomes small. So uh, we can, with that, we can let um, 
the line integral turn into uh, just simply the multiplication of h, which we assume to be constant over this short distance, vector distance L1, same as h2, is it approximately constant over this short distance L sub 2, and so we write that down. We notice that uh, the direction of L2 and L1 are opposite, meaning uh, L2 is equal to minus L1, so we can substitute that in. Um, and then uh, we let L1 equal to just L times like a, a y hat, which is, uh, I'm sorry, an x hat. But really that's the tangential vector, the vector that's parallel to the intercourse. And so we call that tangential vector t hat, right? Uh, so we have something very similar. We have h1 dot t hat minus h2 dot t hat is equal to k uh, i surface over l. So we've taken the magnitude l over to the denominator. Most books um, call this a denote or reserve the letter capital K for a surface current density. All right, and it is uh, the current assumed to be entirely at the surface divided by a length along the surface, all right? And that's called the surface current density. So that's the right-hand side, a scalar K, surface current density. The left-hand side, this dot product filters out or selects out the tangential component of H1 and the tangential component of H2. So what we have here is H1 parallel, most books call it, minus H2 parallel is equal to K, okay? So just like with these, if we have entirely all dielectrics, we don't have any surface currents, and therefore K will be equal to zero, and we have H1 parallel is equal to H2 parallel. However, with metals, you can obviously have large surface current densities, and this tells you how the, uh, how the parallel components, the tangential components of H, vary as you go across that interface that has this surface current K. All right? So that's boundary condition number two. Okay? So now we have the two final boundary conditions. Uh, we have three and four that use del dot b is equal to zero and del cross e is equal to minus the time derivative partial of the um, magnetic flux. Uh, very similar to what we have with del cross h. Uh, Maxwell equation is equal to j plus d over dt of the electric flux. All right, so we do the same thing. And uh, because it's almost identical, uh, this using Gaussian pill boxes, this using appearing loops, we don't have to do the whole calculation over again. We, we can look and say, okay, this side is zero, so the only change to the very, when looking at del dot D is equal to rho free, is that we don't have a rho magnetic free over here, it's zero. So we can skip straight and write down the final uh, result is that the perpendicular components of the magnetic flux density are equal, meaning B1 perpendicular minus B2 perpendicular is equal to zero. Likewise, uh, for this equation, we don't have any magnetic current, so my J is zero, and we only have this part of it, which is we let H go to zero in our Imperial loop, this disappeared. So we just, we, we, we result in, uh, we get that E1 parallel is equal to E2 parallel, or E1 parallel minus E2 parallel is equal to zero. All right, so the parallel components of the electric field across an interface are equal, all right? So we have our four boundary conditions. We have this, for one boundary condition, this for two, and we have three and four. 
So those are uh, our boundary conditions. Very easy to get. Um, and absolutely straightforward. And no real complexity or hidden meaning or anything. That's it. Fairly simple. Okay? So if I've gone too quickly uh, with that, like I said, I, I am going quickly because this is all review material, or it should be. Um, if not, uh, you'll have to do a decent amount of reading. And again, I refer you to the David Griffiths book is very good. We also have uh, Sadiku, I can see him someplace. Um, where is he? Uh, Sadiku is a good book. Uh, Alanis is sort of the Bible electromagnetics that has everything. Um, and, and Jackson, of course, David Jackson's book. Uble is a good book, but uh, any one of them uh, will treat the boundary conditions the exact same way, but potentially in a, a few more steps, but nothing all that more, much. I haven't skipped too many things, except for I just used the fact that we had already done del dot b, del dot b, uh, and so we didn't have to go through the calculation again to get this. Likewise for this one, All right? Okay. So we needed to know those boundary conditions uh, to get anywhere with interfaces, or namely the optical properties at an interface. So now let's look at the very first example of optical properties for this interface. All right. That would be reflection and transmission uh, for a single interface. All right. So we're going to have two materials. Material one above uh, the z-axis and material two below it. All right. And then we're going to have a beam coming down. So we have an incident beam coming down at, at an angle theta i, and we're going to have a reflected beam coming uh, at an angle theta r. All right. Now we're going to denote uh, electric fields have polarizations, and the convention uh, is that this is uh, this situation we see right here is called the TE polarization, transverse electric meaning that the electric field is going to be transverse or parallel to the um, plane of the interface, which is the YZ plane uh, is the plane of the interface between material one and material two. All right. And the electric field is pointing in the Y direction coming out of the paper, out of the mill. All right. And so, um, because we had, as I went over in a previous lecture, the triad of vectors, if k is pointing downwards, and so this is the incident beam coming down, uh, this is the reflected beam coming back up, so we have k this direction, e coming out, and so we have h pointing perpendicular to both k and h, and, uh, and so it's, it's going down in this direction, all right? Uh, likewise, E is in the Y direction, and here uh, K is coming up in that direction. That tells us H has to be pointing in that direction. All right. Now, we don't concern ourselves uh, for the mo moment or at all about is E coming out of the paper or going into the paper. As it turns out, it doesn't matter uh, because after w that will fall out of the calculations. Uh, whether whether we should have an X here denoting E going in or whether uh, we have the arrow head because E is coming out of the board. Um, as it turns out, it obviously oscillates going in and out of the board depending on where you're at uh, along this path. All right? But it all falls out of the calculation, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so we have the incident beam and the reflected beam coming up here. The only other beam uh, possible is the transmitted beam, all right? And so it very well may have a different, in fact, it does, obviously, uh, angle of transmission in the substrate uh, denoted by theta sub t, all right? But E is either coming out of the paper or into the paper, so it has a y hat component only, whereas H has an x hat and z hat component only. All right, we have a few definitions. Uh, 
we have x to z and y coming out of the paper. So we have the k1 x component is equal to k1 cosine theta 1. Uh, k1 z component is k1 sine theta. And then we have um, then we have the k1 x squared plus k1 z squared is equal to k1 squared, which is equal to n1 k squared, n is the index of refraction, times k0 squared, where k0 is equal to omega over c. It's also equal to 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is a free space label. Likewise, k2x is equal to k2 cosine theta 2, or transmission. k2z is uh, k2 sine theta 2. All right. So I, sometimes I, instead of using theta 2, t, I use theta 2 to denote material 2. All right. So um, this could be theta t as well. All right, we have the same thing. K2x squared plus K2y squared is equal to K2 squared is equal to N squared K0 squared. All right, so the TE polarization, that's what we're treating here. So we only, uh, it's a plane wave coming in, so we've, uh, and our incident wave is coming straight down, all right? And we're going to use a E to the minus I omega T time dependence. Okay, so that's different than some engineering notation that, that use e to the plus j omega t uh, as the time dependence. We are using e to the minus i omega t time dependence. Okay, so light coming down along the x-axis, meaning energy is flowing downwards, uh, we will have a e to the minus i k1x x to represent that that beam is coming down, uh, and it's also going to the in the positive z direction. So it's um, plus i k one zz. So this is represents the plane wave that is the incident beam impinging upon our interface between material one and material two. All right. So from Maxwell's equations, we get that uh, the relation between E and H as this. This comes straight from Maxwell's equations. Um, which one did I put over there? Uh, like that. It comes from this one here. All right. Um, and and so this del cross turns into a k1 cross e all right actually i and then that i cancels with this all right so my k only has a um, x and z component only has an x and z component the incident wave it has a negative k1 x component for x and uh, and a positive k1z z component all right it's in the y direction so we have the y hat here and this is and this is what we have so we have to do this cross operation right here that, that. we do that and the resultant is this right here this right, very simple so you can verify that in the notes very simple basically x cross y is equal to z uh, z cross y uh, is equal to minus x hat all right so um, so that is the incident wave. This is the electric field, this is the magnetic field. And note that we're able to express the amplitude of the electric field in terms of E sub i, and likewise the magnetic field can be expressed in E sub i, but with a few factors in front in this k, these k's. The reflected field, um, the electric field of this reflected wave only has a y component. And we will express its amplitude in this way, where we say, well, it's probably going to be proportional to the intensity of the incident field. All right. So we pull that out and we say, OK, E sub i uh, is the intensity, the amplitude of the, the amplitude of the incident field, we pull that out. But uh, there's going to be a multiplicative factor in front of it that describes how well this interface can reflect the energy. 
and that is this lowercase r. All right, so this is the key part of this whole thing that we're going to be trying to figure out, this lowercase r. So this is the reflected wave. Note that we don't have the minus sign in front of uh, here anymore because it's going in the positive x hat direction. And we use the same relation between uh, E and H to get the magnetic field for this reflected wave. And this is what we get. All right. Now for the transmitted beam, it is going downwards. And it also is in material 2. So we have to use K2X, K2Z up here. And we have to use mu2 down here in the denominator, the permeability of um, material 2 as opposed to the permeability of material 1, okay? Um, at least for the next few lectures, we will only be dealing with non-magnetic materials, so mu1 will be equal to mu2, all right? Now, the amplitude of this transmitted wave, similar to what we had for the reflected wave, uh, we have it proportional to E sub i, uh, but with this factor of T in front of it that describes how well this interface allows the wave to get through that interface. Right. So we have all the beams now. We have the electric field, we have the incident wave, we have the reflected wave, and we have the transmitted wave. All right. Okay, so those are the wave representations the plane wave representations of what we have going on. Now we have to apply the boundary conditions uh, that we developed a little while ago. So fairly simple. We now we deal first with the parallel component of the electric field. All right. So we have um, two wave components at this, so this is at x is equal to zero. All right, this is at x is equal to zero. So we have the incident wave plus the reflected wave. Um, that at x is equal to zero has to be equal to um, the parallel component of the transmitted wave given by this. All right, so this now we can cancel out e sub i's. And then we see two things. This is interesting. We, this is only going to be satisfied over, for all possible z values, all possible z values along the interface, if k1z is equal to k2z. So k1z must be equal to k2z. So from this equation right here, you can go back to the definitions of what is k1z and what is k2z to get or to derive Snell's law. And that'll be a homework problem, to derive Snell's law from this equation. Very simple. But you should do it. So once you do that, once you do let k1z equal to k2z, you can cancel all these, and you get that this must also occur. 1 plus r is equal to t. All right? So that's what we have from boundary condition number 1. All right. Now, from boundary condition number two, um, we use as that boundary condition H parallel uh, boundary condition with no surface current. All right. So for the moment, we just assume that we have dielectrics. All right. Uh, so we have uh, the magnetic field for the incident wave, the reflected wave, and the transmitted wave. Uh, in material one, we have the incident and reflected. Material two, we only have the transmitted. So that yields this equation right here. A lot of things cancel. The omegas cancel. We're work, working with non-magnetic materials, but actually here, I, I say, I still let mu one be different than mu two, but we won't assume. Uh, we'll set these two things equal and cancel them out at some point here fairly soon. These exponentials canceled out, E sub i's canceled out, and we get this equation right there. All right. Um, we also have the normal component of the magnetic flux, uh, and we could we could try that as well. And uh, and then when you do calculate that, the magnetic flux, 
density and, and use this boundary condition, you get this right here, uh, this equation, but these two things are equal, so you get 1 plus r is equal to t, and then you realize, oh, that's the same thing we got up here. And so, yes, indeed, that's the case. So basically, we have gleaned all the information when we've gotten this equation and this equation. Those are the two equations we need to solve for r and t. All right, so once you do that, you can do a little bit of algebra. It doesn't take very long at all. Um, not, not complex at all to get, uh, and then put in what K2x is and K1x is in terms of the incident and transmitted angles. Um, and, and these are the indices of refraction, not the impedance eta that's in a lot of electromagnetics books, I think including Griffiths. All right. Uh, and so this will be a little bit different, I mean, substantially different. And basically, you'll have uh, these two things switched in, in one and in two switched if these are eta's impedances instead of indexing refraction. All right. Um, and you can actually, you should be able to figure out why that's the case if you're using impedances, while it will, why it would be eta 2 minus eta 1 up here. All right. But uh, optics books have it as index of refraction, so we have this as one of our Fresnel coefficients, all right, for any angle coming in, any angle theta i, all right. Um, and then likewise, you have the transmission as well. Okay, I guess I didn't have down here also the very simple law that is derived using this equation here, the Snell's law, which is n1 sine theta i is equal to n2 sine theta t, all right, the famous Snell's law, okay? So you'll need that uh, along with these two equations uh, to understand everything about the optical properties of an interface, all right? So for Normal incidence, uh, your theta i is zero, your theta t is zero from Snell's law, uh, and you just get these results right here. All right. Now, so these are really just for the te. So uh, I should have rte and tte here for the um, transverse electric conditions. All right. Um, now, from Snell's law, you can also get uh, things such as total internal reflection, uh, which is when um, the light is coming in at a particular theta i and your theta t is 90 degrees. So basically does not get into material 2. The light cannot get into material 2 if your theta uh, t is equal to pi over 2, not theta i. You can some typos here. We're going to have to fix that. So when theta t is equal to two uh, pi over two. So Snell's law, uh, you'll have sine of pi over two, which is one, and so you have k1 sine theta i, but this is at this critical angle that we'll call theta sub c down here, will be equal to k sub two your K, K1 is equal to N1 K0, your K2 is equal to N2 times K0, cancel the K0, solve for the theta critical, this is the total, uh, angle at which total internal reflection occurs, is equal to the arc sine of N2 over N1. So this would, what you could do, you could figure out in a fiber optic, uh, the, the angle at which light from the inside of the glass material uh, for angles uh, greater than this theta c light uh, impinging on the interface between the glass and and uh, air the outside uh, angle above which that the, the light cannot escape. All right. Now we go over the T M polarization. So the T and polarization, uh, all we do really is switch E for H up here, 
and use a different Maxwell's equation uh, here. And so we have h now uh, is fully in the y direction, propagating again downwards in the minus x hat direction and, uh, and in the positive z hat direction. And then we have Maxwell's equations that gives us a relation between h and e. So we have an incident wave, uh, we have a reflected wave, and we have a transmitted wave, just like we had in the TE polarization. All right? So as clever, as intelligent engineers and scientists, uh, we say, well, we should be able to, with our knowledge, be able to uh, use some of the tools uh, so that we don't have to redo all of our work. And that's the case if you use something called the duality principle. You basically compare uh, Maxwell's equations and these, these uh, waves and say, what is the difference between them? It looks like there's only some differences in some factors out in front right here. So we should get the same results uh, for TM polarization as we get for TE, as long as we replace in our TE solution, we let E go to H in our TE solutions. So wherever we have E, we, we assign H to it. Wherever we have h, we assign minus e. Wherever we have mu, we assign that to epsilon. And wherever we have epsilon, we assign it to mu. And then the TE solutions turn into the TM solutions. That's called the duality principle electromagnetics. Very powerful tool that saves you a lot of work in a lot of different situations. All right? Rather than redoing three pages worth of work. So we can go directly to the uh, Fresnel coefficients for oblique incidences for um, the TM situation. And we just do what I said. And we get these results right here um, that are different. Instead of N1 here, we have N2. Instead of N2 here, we have N1. And instead of N1 here, we have N2. Um, so so that's those are the difference between TE polarization and TM polarization. All right. Um, there is one other key difference here uh, that the reflection, the reflectance, which is equal to the reflection coefficient uh, squared, or really the magnet, reflection coefficient times this complex conjugate. Um, that's the reflectance. The transmittance. Uh, the amount of energy being delivered uh, to the substrate uh, is equal to the pointing vector, uh, the x component of the pointing vector in the substrate, divided by the x component of the pointing vector in the superstrate. All right, so it's basically the amount of energy going in the going downwards relative to how much energy is delivered, all right? So relative, meaning in the denominator. So that's why it's the incident pointing vector x component. Uh, that's why you divide the output x component of the pointing vector by that amount. And so if you do the math here, you know the pointing vector for a harmonic wave is one half real E cross H complex conjugate. And so you do this, you get the k2x over k1x, epsilon 1 over epsilon 2. And you work this out, um, and, uh, and for normal incidence, it's going to be, e so this is for normal incidence, it's square root epsilon 1 over square root of epsilon 2, where these square roots are n1 over n2 for the tm, all right, uh, polarization. So this right here is for normal incidence. I'll make that as well. So this is normal incidence. Now that's different than the TE polarization. The TE polarization has N2 over N1. So that is going to be important um, in order for you to get right answers, which we all strive for. So, N2 versus N1 for TE, 
and 1 over m2 for tm here. All right. Again, I'm going quickly because this is really only review. Uh, I refer you to Griffiths and other materials to get uh, more information on all of this. Um, all right, next, next, a little item uh, that one should cover. Not doesn't really pertain too much. We don't really use this all that much in pattern materials um, and structures, um, but be a little bit remiss not to go over it, is the thing called the Brewster angle. For TM polarization, for light on an incident on an interface that has TM polarization, you can encounter a situation where, that, where there is no reflectance at all of the wave uh, that's incident on this material. That all the light seems to get in. You have a perfectly transmitting interface, which is a little unusual. Uh, and so that's why when somebody discovered it, namely Brewster, uh, this phenomenon was named after it. It only occurs in the TM polarization, not the TP. So let's see if we can get how we get this reflectance to go to zero. It's simple, right? You just say, well, all right. Uh, you just simply let N1 cosine theta 2 is equal to N2 cosine theta i. And here R will be zero. Yeah, so back at the time, uh, that was significant enough to have this phenomenon named after you, and uh, even though now it seems obvious. And so we do that, all right? And so we have this equation that we want to satisfy in order for there to be no reflection. And we also have Snell's Law. So don't forget Snell's Law. That comes from the conservation of the momentum in the um, parallel direction, meaning parallel to the interface. Uh, that's basically what Snell's law is. It's k1x is equal to k2x. I'm sorry, are we using z or x for this? No. Oh, we're using z. So k1z is equal to k2z. Uh, that's basically what Snell's law is telling you. Conservation of momentum along the interface, at the interface. Um, so with these two equations, this right here and this right here, you can work with it and, uh, and finally, after a little bit of algebra, get down to this condition for your incident angle. So your incident angle, theta i, has to be equal to theta b, which satisfies this relation right here. When this relation is satisfied for your theta i, you will observe no reflection for the TM polarization. All right. All right, so I am going to actually stop this recording at this point to, in order to keep the file size somewhat smaller. So I'm gonna start a new recording when I go over this example right here. So let me stop this now and start a new one. Uh, oh yeah. 53 minutes. Okay, so this is going to be a big recording. Um, all right, so I'll start up a new one with the example.